Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, to get away from uh, some winter weather in, in New York, and I'm very happy to be talking about the economic outlook uh, for the global economy in 2012. And I, I want to say I'm, I'm happy that it's defined as 2012, because as I go through my remarks here, what I want to emphasize both is a certain degree of clarity on what's happening in the world right now. Um, that's in some ways what's behind the title here that talks about a world that's cyclical. Um, but I also want to emphasize that I think it's very hard in the current environment to extrapolate too far ahead as we are facing, I think, a number of really important challenges, challenges that to a large degree reflect decisions in the political space, which the last thing I would like to do either for the U.S. or for Europe uh, or for anywhere else for that matter, uh, try to really express a very strong and, and confident view. Um, Paul and Bill expressed to some degree an outlook on the global economy and perhaps it's useful for me uh, doing this right now to provide a little bit of a contrast because I think there is something of a contrast. And as I give you my views, I want to emphasize really three things, uh, focusing again mostly on what is happening this year. Uh, the first thing I want to emphasize is lift, and I think that is the key part of what we see as a very cyclical world right now. Uh, we think 2011 was very disappointing. Uh, that disappointment reached its uh, uh, most extreme at the end of the year. We had the weakest quarter globally in this cycle. But we think we are in the process of fading shocks in the world economy. We are in the process of getting some important policy supports. And while growth right now in the first quarter is still below trend globally, uh, what we are looking for is a fairly significant lift as we make our way through the next six or nine months. I think that lift has already started in the United States. Uh, the U.S. grew 3% in the fourth quarter of last year. It's probably going to dip somewhat in this quarter, but we think the U.S. is going to basically stabilize growth this year somewhere in the 25 to 3% range. What's crucial is watching what's happening elsewhere in the world right now, and we think the second stage of lift is actually taking place right now, and I'd characterize the area that's happening in is non-China Asia. If you look at the Korean, the Taiwanese, the Singapore economies, all of the Pacific Rim, uh, these economies are starting to lift right now. I think it's premature to see the turn in China. I think it's premature to expect the euro area to be out of recession. But those are the big prizes we expect as we make our way through this year. And by the middle of the year, we expect China that I would agree with Bill will probably start the year somewhere in the 65 to 7% range. We expect it to be growing above 9% as we move through the middle part of the year. And we think the euro area, which is now probably contracting at about a 1% pace, will probably be stagnant uh, in the second half of the year. Not very good in absolute terms, but part of this lift nonetheless. This is a story about near-term cyclical stuff. I want to emphasize as well the idea that behind the scenes, part of what's happening here is we're seeing some fundamental things which are getting better. I want to emphasize really three things here on that front, uh, one being the healing that's taking place in the U.S. private sector. And I think it is really important to understand how much better shape the U.S. corporate and household sector are relative to where they were 12 months ago, certainly relative to where they were 24 months ago. I think it's really important to understand the monetary policy shifts that are taking place in the European space by the ECB, and potentially, this is still somewhat speculative, but in the Japanese case on the part of the BOJ. And finally, we started 2011 with a major concern about divergences in the world and the potential for overheating in emerging markets, uh, credit cycles getting out of control, and I think we have created space here, and that space may not last all that long, but it is, I think, an important positive that will allow us, both in 2012 and probably a little bit beyond that, uh, to grow without that risk hanging over our heads. The last thing I want to emphasize is we can't extrapolate, and the issues I want to focus on in terms of showing you a few pictures do highlight what are some really difficult uh, and, and very large fiscal decisions in the U.S., some very difficult and large existential decisions in Europe, and some really difficult, I think, issues that will be in place over the next two to four years, uh, thinking about countries and emerging markets, and certainly most, most other places in the world. But again, I want to spend most of my time here trying to give you a sense of why we think what's happening in the world is that we're starting to lift, the importance of that, and how it's going to play itself out in, in numbers. Of course, as I, as I go through this, I'm not going to say anything specifically about Australia. 
It is good news for Australian growth, this lift, and we have the Australian economy, like the rest of the world, starting off the year on a slow note in the low twos at the beginning of the year, but getting up to 4% growth in the second half. Uh, in our mind, that doesn't allow room for the RBA to ease, uh, and unfortunately, it also, or, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, it probably means the Aussie dollar in this environment will continue to move higher. So let me start, if I could, by making the case for Lyft and explaining to you what we see going on in the global economy right now. And I think there are three things I'd want to really focus on here. The first one being that 2011 was a bad year globally. It started off okay, but we got really into the middle of the year and growth slowed quite materially. Uh, but there were important drags that took us down, drags that we think have started to fade from the scene. The biggest one is the surge in global inflation that took place in the first part of 2011, enormous squeeze on purchasing power. Uh, globally, inflation got up on a six-month annualized basis, close to 5%. In the second half of last year, it moved all the way back down to three, and we think it's on its way down towards 2% in the first half of this year, an important lift uh, that we think has been already reflected in some of the economic news. In addition, we got hit by a sentiment shock of substantial size in the middle of 2011, a lot of that had to do with questions about competency of policy institutions in the U.S. and Western Europe. I don't think those questions have been fully answered, but to some degree the concerns have faded and we're seeing sentiment, we're seeing financial markets reflect in some sense a sigh of relief about the biggest uh, parts of that concern. The other thing that's happened is we've taken out what has been, I think, perhaps the most significant risk factor hanging over the global economy's head and that is the idea that Europe would not be able to contain financial stress, and as a result, we would have a spilling out of credit and financial problems to the whole world. Uh, the important thing there, I think, is the ECB taking ownership over liquidity and funding in the European uh, financial space. They've done an enormous amount with their LTROs, have provided about a trillion euros more liquidity in, in the space of about, in less than six months, and it's done important things in terms of allowing sovereigns to maintain access to the market and really narrowing spreads both in the sovereign and the bank uh, funding space. The third thing that I think is driving our view of what's going to give us lift is a view about the private sector in the United States. Through a tough year in 2011, U.S. corporates actually expanded profit margins. U.S. corporates actually improved their competitive position uh, seeing pricing run well above where unit labor costs grew over the course of the year. And in some ways, the proof is in the pudding. They have been expanding their capital spending plans. Uh, capital equipment spending grew at about a 9% pace over the course of last year. And I think there's plenty to run in a world in which we're still not expanding the capital stock at anywhere near the average pace we've seen over the last 40 or 50 years. Perhaps most importantly, we're seeing a transition in the labor market uh, I don't know how many people realize this, but the private sector in the United States in 2011 generated two million job gains. And what has happened over the last few quarters, and we think will continue to be a major force over the course of this year, is corporates are shifting into a lower productivity mode. They no longer can get the big productivity gains they were able to eke out early in the cycle. They no longer want to, particularly in an environment in which labor costs are growing at a very modest pace. And we are in a world where we think private sector jobs are now likely to grow at about a 200,000 per month pace as we go through 2012. Our forecast for Friday is a 235,000 uh, gain in private payrolls in the U.S. It's a big story. It, to some degree, mirrors what happened in each of the last two expansions, as you can see on this page, where productivity growth surged very early into the expansion. Uh, there was something we called a jobless recovery. And then we transition in the middle part to strong job growth and weak productivity. Not a sign of weakness in the corporate sector, but a transition which I think signals balance and greater health in the private sector overall. Uh, perhaps more controversially even is a view that we have that the household sector is no longer moving to restore balance sheets by raising precautionary savings. The savings rate in the U.S. is not unusually high by historical standards, somewhere in the high 4% range. Uh, but it has moved up, and it has moved up alongside a dramatic fall in investment by the household sector. As a result, net lending, the overall position of the household sector financially with regard to the rest of the economy, is now in meaningful surplus, a higher surplus level we've seen at any point since the early 1980s. Uh, 
Uh, that has been accompanied by a dramatic fall in debt servicing costs. The financial obligations ratio is down also to the lowest point we've seen since the early 1980s. Debt is moving slowly, but amortizations are well above mortgage originations right now. Savings is high, and there's an enormous amount of foreclosed homes, which are still measured as debt on the household sector balance sheet. From our point of view, the household sector has turned neutral, and I think the proof is in the pudding in the sense that 2011, in the face of what we thought were temporary income shocks, the household sector didn't run and raise savings, it actually reduced savings and is now modestly rebuilding it as those shocks fade from the scene.